Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of July 30th, 2012. And we have a syncope case for you this week. It was a, about 17 or 18 year old that was horsing around doing some things with uh, some friends, and they noted that he had a syncopal episode. Now, they did say that he did not have any type of trauma, they swore up and down. To whatever extent that you're willing to believe his teenage friends, they, there was no trauma involved, no drugs used, and he had a syncopal episode. And it was true syncope, which means he had a sudden and brief loss of postural tone, and then he woke up without any specific medical intervention. He woke up without any postictal period, and he was back to normal, but uh, his mother convinced him to come into the emergency department. So, of course, the first thing he gets when he arrives is... A CBC. No, I'm just kidding. He got an, an EKG. He probably got the useless CBC and electrolytes and everything else also. He's a healthy guy. No nausea, vomiting, no medications, nothing else. And so the utility of every lab test approaches zero except for the all-important 12-lead EKG, which, as we've discussed before, can sometimes save a life. A piece of paper and ink, that can save a life. And here's the piece of paper that was associated with this kid's syncopal episode. Now, the first thing that you notice hopefully, is that there's a lot of voltage. We call this high left ventricular voltage, HLVV. Big, 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 big QRS complexes in all the leads. Don't make the mistake of calling this left ventricular hypertrophy, all right? Left ventricular hypertrophy implies that there's pathology and there's no pathology here. If you get 12 lead EKGs on young people, they all have gigantic QRS complexes. That's not pathology. Therefore, it's not called LV LVH. It's simply called high left ventricular voltage. And in fact, when you look up the definition of LVH in the EKG books, just as a matter of semantics perhaps, but when you look up the definition of LVH, it, you really aren't supposed to diagnose LVH on 12 lead EKG in people that are under the age of 35 because most young people, especially most young men, have big QRS complexes, and that's perfectly normal. So when you see this, you don't call it LVH, you simply call it high left ventricular voltage. So again, perhaps just a matter of semantics, but I just want to make that clear. So a lot of voltage up here, big QRS complexes, and he's also got a big T wave inversion in lead V1, which becomes upright by the time you get to V2. There's maybe a little artifact, um, but... Um, and by the way, if you're looking at that and thinking, well, maybe that's a P wave right there. Well, if you map it out, it turns out that that little thing's just a little artifact. So let's not make too much of that. I'm not trying to trick you. That's just a little artifact there. Uh, this patient has sinus, uh, a sinus rhythm, maybe a sinus tachycardia rate of approximately 100 or so. And he's got high left ventricular voltage. Well, who cares about that? The other thing that you might notice is he's got these Q waves that are relatively large in these lateral leads, V4, V5, V6. And he's also perhaps got relatively large S waves in lead three and in AVF. You know, what, what are we going to make of all that? High left ventricular voltage and some S waves and some strange Q waves out there in the lateral leads. Well, when you've got a young person who presents with syncope in emergency medicine, we're always thinking about the worst possible thing. And so one of the things that you've got to consider is the possibility of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hopefully that's what a lot of other people are thinking of. And that's what I want to talk about in this particular segment, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We're going to talk about the EKG findings that can be very specific for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You may know this by one of its many other names, IHS, idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, or maybe you know this as asymmetric septal hypertrophy, or maybe you know this as hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or maybe there's a few other names for this. There's probably, I think, about a dozen different names that all pretty much describe the same thing. A hypertrophied, non-dilated left ventricle, and I always specify here when I talk about this condition that this is a non-dilated left ventricle unlike many other cardiomyopathies, and that means that the chest X-ray cardiac silhouette is normal. These patients don't have uh, large mediastinum uh, or cardiac silhouettes on the 12 lead EKG. They've got nice, normal, slim-looking hearts on the chest X-ray because the hypertrophy is on the inside of the heart, so you need a Doppler echo to make the diagnosis here. So a few pearls about the condition before we get into the EKG. 
First thing, when you look at the literature, it's interesting that the, only about half the patients have a family history of HCM, which is a bit of a surprise to many of us. It was when I first read about this, in that I was always under the impression that everybody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a family history of someone else in the family dying of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a sudden death, and only about 50% of the patients, 50-55% of the patients actually have a family history of this. So never rule out this diagnosis simply because the patient has no family history of somebody else having sudden death. The second surprise to me when I read about this condition in the literature is that the average age of diagnosis is, is 30 to 40 years old. That's a bit of a surprise to me because I was always under the impression before reading about this that all the patients who have syncope and sudden death from HCM are teenagers like the patient that we just started with or maybe uh, college athletes. It turns out that the average age of diagnosis is a bit older than that. So don't ever rule out this diagnosis just because you've got, say, a 45-year-old with syncope, especially exertional syncope. Yes, it can occur in 40, 45, 50-year-old patients. It's not always just a teenager or young 20s type of diagnosis. Mortality, about 3.5% per year. Not awful, not like not as bad as some other conditions, but it certainly adds up. Pathophysiology, there's a bunch of different theories as to what causes the problem. I'm going to skip over this slide. You can look it up. Uh, you know, one of the things that we all know is that whenever there's more than two theories, it means nobody really knows for sure. So the, there's a handful of different theories about what's going on. Moving more towards the clinical side of things, clinical features, syncope, chest pain, usually it's atypical type of chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, sudden death. And here's another surprise. Surprise number three. These are not always exertional syncope patients, okay? A lot of these patients are doing nothing in particular when they suddenly have their uh, their syncopal episode. So don't rule this out just because somebody was just sitting watching TV and they suddenly passed out. It doesn't always have to be exertional. Usually it is, but it doesn't always have to be exertional. And usually the syncope or sudden death is attributable attributable to some type of ventricular arrhythmia or a sudden significant drop in cardiac output because of ventricular outflow obstruction. Anyway, let's talk about, <clears throat> uh, let's talk, uh, oh yeah, before we get to the EKG, there's this systolic murmur, which always shows up on the board exam. And if you hear it, you should take the patient through certain positional maneuvers to see if that murmur changes. Uh, again, it's a murmur that always shows up on the board exam. And I'll tell you, during my career, I've seen probably about a half dozen patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and only one or two of them, I, I recall, had a murmur. It's awfully tough to hear these murmurs in a loud, busy emergency department. Uh, so, But if you do hear the murmur, you take them through these positional uh, maneuvers. Okay, now we're on to the EKG abnormalities. Almost all of these patients have some type of EKG abnormality. Most of the abnormalities are non-specific, but we'll talk about what may be very specific. And if you ever find an EKG abnormality that makes you worry, you send these patients for the definitive test, which is a Doppler echo, all right? So not just a plain old echo. Plain old echo will pick up the hypertrophy of the septum, but the Doppler part of the echo helps pick up the severity of the obstruction. And so whenever possible, try to get the Doppler echo. Uh, if nothing else, get an echo, but get the Doppler echo if possible. And if you can't get these patients in for early diagnosis and management with cardiology, then and, and they need to follow up as an outpatient, what you're going to do is put these patients on beta blockers. If for some reason they can't tolerate beta blockers, you use calcium channel blockers. But the key thing is you want to slow down the heart. This is primarily a diastolic filling problem. And so if you ever want to improve somebody's diastolic function, how do you do that? How do you improve somebody's filling? Simple. You slow down the heart to give them more time to fill. So beta blockers are your drug of choice. And if they have ventricular dysrhythmias, the literature says amiodarone is the drug of choice. But in reality, you're just going to admit these patients and get them to see a cardiologist. And there's certain therapies that can be done, surgical therapies and some chemical therapies that are now being used to help treat hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But from the emergency department, beta blockers and admit them uh, and tell them not to exert themselves. If they need to follow up as an outpatient, beta blockers, don't exert yourself. If they're having ventricular arrhythmias, amiodarone, and definitely you're going to admit these patients to cardiology. Okay, more about the EKG since that's why we're here. So the 
EKG abnormalities, as I mentioned, most of these are fairly nonspecific. The most common is high left ventricular voltage and left atrial enlargement, but that's fairly nonspecific. Tall R wave in V1, which can sometimes mimic a posterior MI. Tall R wave is nonspecific. In fact, we wrote a paper a number of years ago about all the different things that can produce a tall R wave in V1. For American Journal of Emergency Medicine, there is about eight to 10 different entities which can produce a tall R wave in V1. But what I want to focus your attention on is these strange Q waves, sometimes in the inferior, but most notably, most notably in the lateral, lateral leads, very deep, very narrow Q waves in the lateral leads. And what I'll tell you is that whenever you see the combination of high voltage, in other words, big QRS complexes with deep, narrow Q waves, especially in those lateral leads, that patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy until proven otherwise. Let me show you a handful of, of sample EKGs. These are real cases just to really hammer home this simple finding. So take a look. Here's a patient that presented after syncope. He arrived. He was awake and alert, asymptomatic upon arrival. We get a 12 lead EKG. He was in his early 20s. And what you notice is big QRS complexes, in other words, high voltage, and very deep, very narrow cues in the lateral leads. Remember, lateral leads are leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6. Now, another mistake that oftentimes occurs, first mistake that occurs, is people call this LVH, and maybe, again, it's just semantics, but this is not LVH. You can't call it LVH in young people. It's simply called high left ventricular voltage. But the other mistake is that sometimes people look at these Q waves and say, hey, this person's had a previous lateral MI. Wrong. These are not infarction Q waves. Infarction Q waves should be at least one box wide, at least 40 milliseconds wide. These are too narrow. Take a look at how narrow these are. These are like little spikes or little daggers. They're too narrow to be called infarction Q waves. This is not an old lateral MI. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's another example. This patient did not have a good outcome. This patient was misdiagnosed. Patient had syncope. He came into the emergency department. He was asymptomatic. And after getting a bunch of labs and, um, and, and watched for a while, he had no arrhythmias. He got discharged to follow up as an outpatient and he didn't make it. Two days later, he dropped dead when he went running to catch a bus. And the diagnosis here was missed by both the emergency physician and the cardiologist. High voltage and deep narrow cues in the lateral leads. There's just nothing else to think about when you see these deep narrow Q waves in those lateral leads with high voltage. Sometimes people look and say, hey, there's these, these abnormal T waves here. Those T waves mean nothing. When you've got high voltage, the T wave, the repolarization always gets screwed up and high voltage oftentimes produces screwed up T waves. So those are fairly nonspecific T waves <clears throat> Just like with LVH, um, L long-standing LVH can screw up your T waves. Well, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients with high voltage can sometimes have uh, abnormal-looking T waves, and they're not specific for ischemia. The key finding here is high voltage and deep narrow cues in those lateral leads. Send this patient for a Doppler echo. <clears throat> Here's another one. High voltage in this patient that presented after syncope and deep narrow cues in the lateral leads. These are very narrow and very deep Q waves. Send this patient for a Doppler echo. You know what? You're going to save this patient's life because if you miss it, the patient goes out, exerts himself, drops dead. This happens all too often. And by the way, you can't always rely on your cardiologists. Cardiologists are great. Their fund of knowledge in emergency cardiology is a bit more limited though. And in emergency electrocardiography, unless you're dealing with a cardiologist who makes a living off reading EKGs and teaching EKGs, which 99% of cardiologists don't, don't expect your cardiologist to know about this. And this isn't meant to be a slam against a cardiologist. The fact is cardiologists learn to diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on echo, not on EKG. Those of us in the emergency department, it's our responsibility to know EKGs. Cardiologists know the echo findings. We have to know the EKGs. High voltage and deep narrow cues in those lateral leads. Here's another example. This patient had a bad outcome also. 
high voltage, and deep narrow cues in the lateral leads. In this case, mainly just one in AVL, not much at all in V5 or V6, but one in AVL, high voltage and deep narrow cues in those lateral leads. And then going back to the original case that we started with, there you've got your high voltage, big, big QRS complexes, and not much in terms of Q waves in one or in AVL, but take a look at V5 and V6, very deep, very narrow Q waves. You send this patient to get a Doppler echo and you will save this patient's life. Now, before we conclude, I need to make one very, very important point. High voltage and deep narrow cues are not present in every one of these cases. It's not a completely sensitive finding. It is, however, very specific. And if you look this up in the EKG textbooks, textbooks by Marriott and Chung and Chow and some of the real gurus, they talk about this. Probably 30 to 40% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, based on what I've read, and it'll vary from author to author, but based on what I've read, 30 to 40% of these patients will have this high voltage and deep narrow cues in the lateral leads. The rest of the patients may not have the deep narrow cues. They all have high voltage, but the rest may not have the deep narrow cues. And so for those patients, you're going to have to rely on your clinical suspicion. But the key point, first thing you always look for is high voltage. And if you can add on to that, those deep narrow cues in the lateral leads, that's very specific for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Send that young syncope patient for a Doppler echo, and you know what? You're going to save a young person's life. So it's a key thing to always look for in every EKG you get on a patient who presents after syncope or near syncope. All right, what are we looking for in syncope EKGs? We're looking for ischemia. We're looking for Brady and tachyarrhythmias. You're looking for WPW. You're looking for prolonged QT make sure you add hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to the list of things that you're always looking for in every post-syncope EKG. Hope that was helpful. Hope that helped save a life. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye for now.